Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Princeton Club. My name is Steve Barnes. I'm Assistant Dean of Public Affairs at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton. Uh, before we get started, if you could just shut off all cell phones and Blackberries and iPhones and trios and, and Palm Pilots, and if anyone still uses those. Uh, thanks for joining us for what I'm sure will be uh, uh, an enlightening, uh, though possibly intense, discussion of America's mortgage crisis. Uh, I'm just going to take a few moments to introduce our panelists. Uh, but before I do, I'd like to note that tonight's event is part of the Wilson School's uh, New York Toman Lecture Series, uh, which is designed to encourage debate about and analysis of some of the most serious issues in public international affairs. In fact, uh, if she's in the room with us, I'm pleased to recognize Lynn Toman, uh, who through uh, her generosity and leadership is responsible for tonight's event and for this series. Lynn, are you with us? There she is. <laughs> Uh, and as you may have observed uh, behind me, uh, our friends at The Economist magazine have graciously agreed to co-host tonight's discussion as part of this Tome and series. Uh, for tonight's topic, I'll leave the analysis to our experts, but I noticed, just as a small observation, uh, that one gauge of how our economy is doing uh, is seen through some recent covers in the last month from The Economist magazine itself. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, one cover blared, The Great American Slowdown, and the cover art was a snail painted up with the American flag, which I thought was a very nice patriotic touch. Um, the first week of April, their cover art featured a broken, very sad-looking piggy bank and was titled Fixing Finance and the Risks of Getting It Wrong. And in late March, the cover was Wall Street, a 10-page special report on the crisis. So if The Economist is any gauge, we're in the right city for this discussion, and more importantly, we're very fortunate to have with us three experts who can shed some light on the mortgage crisis, which is causing a lot of pain in this country and a lot of anguish, and the state of the economy more general. So for our panelists, first we'll hear from Zanny Minton Bedoz, who's the economics editor at The Economist. She's responsible for coverage of the American economy, economic policy, and issues surrounding globalization. Uh, before moving to Washington in 1996, she was the magazine's emerging, emerging markets correspondent, based, based in London. Uh, she joined The Economist in 94 after spending two years as an economist with the IMF. After Zanny's remarks, we'll hear from Peter Orzag, who is the director of the Congressional Budget Office in Washington. He began his term in January 2007. Before joining CBO, he was senior fellow and deputy director of economic studies at Brookings in Washington, D.C. Uh, his prior government service has included working as special assistant to the president for economic policy and senior economic advisor at the National Economic Council during 1997 and 98. Earlier, he served on the President's Council of Economic Advisors. I should add, in the spirit of full dis disclosure, he is uh, a graduate of Princeton's fighting class of 1991. After Peter, we'll hear from Professor Alan Blinder, who's been on the Princeton faculty since 1971, uh, in economics, obviously, though recently he joined the school formally as a joint appointment. Uh, from 1993 through 1996, he served in the U.S. government, first as a member of President Clinton's original Council of Economic Advisors, and then as vice chair of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Uh, most of you know and have read some of his many books on the topics of central banking and other aspects of economic policy, uh, and have read his innumerable op-eds and seen his appearances and commentary on the major U.S. network news programs. Uh, he's agreed to moderate tonight's session, including our Q&A. Uh, and in terms of the format of tonight's event, first we'll hear from our panelists, and we'll turn the floor over to you for your questions. We'll have a couple of uh, handheld mics uh, that we'll pass around. So once again, thanking, uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening as part of the New York Tolman Lecture Series. And without any further ado, I'll turn the floor over to Zanny. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Welcome. I'm on behalf of The Economist. Thanks all for coming. Uh, I have the easiest task tonight by far. My task is to describe briefly how we got into this mess. I'm going to leave the much tougher task of uh, how to get out of it to my two esteemed colleagues. Um, so before we start, I think we need to, to define a little bit what we mean by this mess. Obviously, it's the nasty combination of falling house prices and soaring foreclosures that characterizes what is America's worst housing bust since the Depression. House prices are tumbling as the huge housing bubble unwinds. Just how fast and how far depends on which index you use. Uh, 
If you use the Case-Shiller index, it's had bigger declines. The 20-city average is down 30%, 13% from its peak, um, and the pace of decline is accelerating. And if you look at the imbalance between the demand for homes and the supply of them, the supply overhang, clearly prices have a lot further to fall. And pretty much everybody expects more double-digit price falls to come. Almost 9 million people owe more on their mortgages than their house is now worth. They have negative equity. That will probably rise to about 14 million or so over the next couple of years. Not surprisingly, foreclosure rates are soaring. Um, they're up almost 60% on a year ago. Some 6% of all mortgage borrowers are behind on their payments. About 17 or 18% of subprime borrowers are delinquent. And over a million loans, 2% of the total, or double the average of the past 30 years, are in some part of the process of foreclosure. And most people expect about 2 million or so people to face foreclosure over the next year or so. Now, we're a long way from the Depression when half mortgage loans were in default. But we are at the highest rates of foreclosure that we've seen in modern history. This housing mess has spawned what the normally sober IMF has described as the worst financial crisis since the Depression. Basically, you know the story, but starting in, in the, the middle of last year, as losses from subprime mounted, investors fled mortgage-backed securities and all the complex panoply of, of um, collateralized debt obligations built on them. Because no one knew who held the losses, people fled from all kinds of markets, that all kinds of markets became dysfunctional. Banks, it's turned out, hold rather more of the losses than people expected. And that's precipitated, the, the write-downs from banks have precipitated a large-scale process of deleveraging tighter credit conditions, which in turn has worsened the housing bust. Whole swaths of mortgage lending, some 750 billion of mortgage lending, has basically dried up. As a result, it's harder to get mortgages. That, and it's basically harder to get credit overall. Tighter credit has slowed the economy. It's, in, it's one of the many factors weighing on the American consumer, pushing the economy close to, if not into recession. That in turn raises the risk of more foreclosures as people without a job can't keep up their mortgage payments. So you see the risk of a nasty downward spiral. We're nowhere near, I don't think, the end of this mess. Certainly in the past few weeks, financial markets have calmed, but I think the weakening of the real economy has really only just started. And just to give you a sense of um, how far we may be from the end, there's quite a sober study that the IMF did in 2002 where they looked at housing busts in rich countries since 1945, and many of those housing busts were rather smaller than the one we face here, and on average, the hangover lasted about four years. So we're in a big mess, um, and we're nowhere near the end of it. How did we get into it? Well, there's no shortage of villains. Um, whenever a financial and economic calamity occurs on this scale, fingers will point in many directions. And they have done. Fingers have pointed from the bottom of the mortgage chain to fraudulent salesmen who sold inappropriate mortgages to gullible people, to the very top, particularly to Alan Greenspan, who is accused of leaving interest rates too low for too long and caring too little about financial regulation. In between, any number of villains from uh, ratings agencies that were both incompetent and compromised to investment banks that mistook the complexity of their products for safety. Um, Alan, in fact, wrote an excellent article in the New York Times, I think, what, October last year, where he talked of six fingers of blame. And I've always wondered why he stopped at six. I think one can easily end up with two, two hands worth of blame. But my approach tonight is actually going to be slightly different. Rather than running through a litany of villains, I want to... Uh, to point out that at its heart, this whole crisis is um, something we've seen many times before in history, the hangover of a bubble. It has all the classic symptoms of the hangover from a bubble, and we've had bubbles from the South Sea bubble or the tulip mania of the 17th century. Um, and if we go, which is I'm going to do briefly, through a potted history of the past decade, I think we'll find that four characteristics came together in a kind of perfect storm. Firstly, there was financial innovation that began, for my purposes, really in the late 1990s with the extension of the subprime market, but then went beyond in, in all of the newfangled instruments that were invented on Wall Street. Secondly, it was fueled by cheap money. The Fed cut rates sharply after 2001 and kept them low, arguably for too long, I think for too long. Thirdly, that looseness of monetary policy was exacerbated by globalization, by global capital markets, because a flood of capital came from savings-rich countries, such as China, which kept long-term rates low even as the Fed started tightening. And fourthly, it seems to me that the scale of the problem was worsened by politi the political fetish for home ownership in this country. Instead of worrying about the pace of at which subprime lending was growing, regulators and politicians cheered it on. 
Instead of worrying about the pace at which prices were rising, there was a broad belief that you couldn't have a national house price bubble in a continental economy like the US. None of these factors alone bears all the blame, but together they, they created what has turned out to be a monumental mess. So let me briefly flesh that out by, by basically breaking the past decade into four stages. Stage one was the late 1990s. That was the emergence of subprime lending. There were innovations in finance, particularly the automatic automization of credit scoring, which accelerated the securitization of mortgages in non-traditional mortgages. People who could not traditionally qualify for conventional loans, Fannie, that those guaranteed by Fannie and Freddie, now had access to mortgages. Part of that was also the lagged effect of regulatory changes, the end of usury laws in the 1980s, which meant which allowed lenders basically to charge higher rates for riskier borrowers. Millions of people, starting in the late 1990s, got access to mortgages that hadn't had it before. This was rightly hailed as a great innovation, but it had two important characteristics. The first is that much of the growth of subprime lending was outside the traditional banking system, independent mortgage brokers and mortgage companies. Thus, it was outside the traditional regulatory structure. The US has a complicated banking regulatory structure. The Fed is only one part of a panoply, but this is basically, this, this growth took place outside the remit of that federal structure. And secondly, the process of securitization meant that lenders had little incentive to check the credit worthiness of their borrower. Once the loan was sold on, they had little skin in the game. And those two characteristics became more and more important as the, as the bubble intensified. Stage two, this really begins after the Fed started cutting rates dramatically in the wake of the investment bust that came after the stock price bubble crashed. The Fed cut rates, cut rates quickly, and then if you remember, there were many fears about deflation and it kept rates extremely low. The real federal funds rate was negative for several years for the longest period since the 1970s. That, that era of cheap money accelerated house price appreciation. House prices had already been rising pretty smartly in the late 1990s. By 2003, 2004, they were rising at double-digit rates in the big cities even faster. By 2003 and 2004, by all traditional gauges, house prices relative to income and rents were overvalued. Rising prices encouraged lenders to provide more credit because delinquency rates were low. And rising prices encouraged a speculative psychology. You had to buy a house quickly because prices were going to go up. It was the classic symptoms of a bubble. And we at The Economist, I think it was in 2003, started warning about a house price bubble. It is true, as Alan said to me earlier, there is a question of how early you can start warning about a bubble and still be credible. Uh, and we were warning about it many times from 2003 onwards. But you certainly can't say that we didn't notice this problem. Um, cheap money, I think, played a starring role. But the Fed is clearly not the only place to point a finger. And the reason for that is that there was a housing bubble throughout the rich world. We started our house price index in 2002, where every quarter we've published a list of house, price, of house prices in most rich economies and many emerging ones. And if you look at that, you'll see that the rising prices here in the US are somewhere in the middle of the range. In the UK, in Ireland and Spain, the pace of house price appreciation was much bigger. Secondly, even when the Fed started to raise rates in 2004, the flood of capital from the savings glut, as Ben Bernanke put it, kept um, long-term rates low. Remember the talk about Greenspan's conundrum in late 2004 or early 2005. That shift in, the, in, in global capital markets exacerbated the Fed's problems. But the problem in the US, I suspect, so there was a housing bubble in many other places. The US was not alone. The, the problem that made the mess here I think bigger than it will turn out to be in most other countries with the possible exception of the UK, is that the housing bubble interacted with Wall Street's innovation that I mentioned earlier. In many European economies which saw huge house price rises, mortgage markets are much less developed. But the US, innovation continued apace, packaging mortgage-backed securities into a dizzying array of products, collateralized debt obligations, CDOs, or CDO squares. Squared, CDOs, do we have CDOs cubed? I think we did even. Risk was sliced, diced in an, in an extremely complicated way, and basically rating agencies declared the top tranches of these securities to be safe, and investors around the globe, who were hungry for higher yields because long-term interest rates were so low, demanded more and more of these products because you could get, for seemingly no risk, higher yields. It was what Alan Greenspan rightly, I think, called an addiction to the cocaine of high yield. And this really grew to its biggest excesses in 2006, which I think is stage three of the problem. The mania reached its peak in 2006. 
House prices themselves peaked towards the middle of the year. The, S the um, Case-Shiller 10 City Index ended up 200% higher than it was in 1997. At the same time in 2006, lending standards plummeted. 20% of all mortgages made in 2006 were subprime mortgages. 44% of all mortgages were so-called liar loans, loans with limited or no documentation. And 30% of all mortgages were for 100% of the value of the house. And it was in 2006 that we started to hear about ninja loans, no income, no job, no assets. <laughs> this was, um, it was really 2006 that the bubble, which we'd been worrying about, became a really fully-fledged mania. And I, I, I would submit that many of the problems today really stem from 2006. And it's in 2006, I think, that one can really point the finger at the regulators, because that's when, if one had had more regulatory oversight and more and regulators not asleep at the wheel in 2006, we would not have nearly the problems that we have today. Now, however, that didn't happen, and it was only in 2007 when the market itself realized what was happening, that the tide turned. Early in 2007, it became clear that many of the subprime loans that had been made only months before were already d going delinquent and moving into default. Default and delinquency rates were rising alarmingly. Many subprime mortgage companies were starting to go bust. These problems became clear early in 2007, but it was really only in August, as you know, that they hit with a vengeance. That's when the mortgage market dried up. That's when financial markets started going into a turmoil from which they're only just recovering. House price declines accelerated as, the, as finance essentially dried up, and we found ourselves in today's mess. So what, what does this history tell us? Well, I think it was a perfect storm. Innovation, cheap money, lack of regulation. Some of those excesses could have been avoided. I would submit that had monetary policy, had interest rates been tight, raised more quickly in 2003 and 2004, some of this might have been avoided, but not all of it. And I, even more, I would submit that regulators could and should have been more awake in 2006 particularly. But having said all of that, I don't think this entire episode would have been avoided. The history of financial markets is a history of bubbles. Crises are inevitable, um, an inevitable part of the process of financial innovation. And that innovation, by and large, is a good thing. And I think as we figure out how to clean up this mess, we need to think about how to make changes. We need to think about how to try to make the system safer. But we should be careful not to throw the baby of financial innovation out with the bathwater. Thank you. Makes you think that JFK had it backwards when he said success has a thousand fathers and failure is an orphan. Um, when I was preparing for this, I uh, realized that I had written my undergraduate thesis on a related topic entitled Congressional Oversight of the Federal Reserve. So after a long day of visiting with members of Congress, which is the typical thing I do during my day, I came home and thought that I would look for some deep insight into what I wrote 17 years ago. And I found very informative statements like, what steps can be taken to ameliorate the situation? Perhaps the Congressional Budget Office could hold briefings for all members of Congress, or at least those members who sit on the banking committees in the Joint Economic Committee. And I realized that I had absolutely no idea then what I'm doing now. And for that, Princeton awarded it a prize. Uh, uh, in, in thinking about what we are going to do going forward, it's important to think about what we're trying to accomplish. And I think the policy world is trying to accomplish many things at the same time, and they're not always perfectly correlated. They're not always the same thing. Some people or some policymakers want to stabilize prices in the housing market. As you've already heard from Zanny, there are, there's been a significant downward pressure on prices. I think most of that pressure at this point is coming from the stock of unoccupied houses for sale that are putting downward pressure on housing prices. And that stock is elevated, and most of the proposals that are under discussion sort of don't get at that directly. A second objective is to reduce foreclosures, because we know that they're, they're painful and costly. A third is to support credit and financial markets. And a fourth is to stabilize the macro economy. And they often get kind of all mushed together in different proposals. And Sometimes the result is actually uh, an internal inconsistency. So for example, uh, there has been already passed a uh, proposal. I'm going to focus just for the sake of argument on reducing foreclosures because a lot of the recent policy proposals are, are surrounding that. Some of the things that have been done and that are proposed to be done would, at least at the margin, increase foreclosures. 
So for example, one of the things that we've already done is that previously, if a house was foreclosed, and so you had a debt of you know, $200,000, and the house was only worth $190,000, and the house was foreclosed, you walked away, that $10,000 difference was treated as a forgiveness of, loan, of a loan, and it was taxed. And we have now eliminated the tax on that loan forgiveness, I think out of a sort of sense of fairness or, or equity. But at, you know, at the margin, that was a disincentive to, uh, to go through the foreclosure process. And we've now kind of, at least from the borrower perspective, taken some of the burden off of that. I don't want to, think, I don't want to say it's a big deal, but at the margin, you would think that puts upward pressure on foreclosures. Similarly, there are proposals uh, in play to create tax credits for the purchase of foreclosed houses or to provide subsidies to state and local governments to buy foreclosed houses. And if you're a lender going through this process of wondering whether you should foreclose on a house or not, the fact that you might be able to sell it at a somewhat better price should make that process somewhat more attractive. The point just being that we have not been entirely clear about what we're trying to accomplish and sometimes we're operating at cross purposes to uh, what some of the objectives are. So let's talk about the proposals that are aimed at reducing the level of foreclosures. And first we need to talk a little bit about the foreclosure process. Even in good times, foreclosures happen. So two or three or four years ago in the midst of that bubble that the economist was decrying, there were about a million, foreclo a million uh, starts of the foreclosure process. So the foreclosure process would start and about half of that, so about a half a million a year, would actually wind up with the house being foreclosed and sold. The other half, uh, some deal would be worked out between the lender and the borrower to avoid that process. But the point being that even during good times, there's some level of foreclosure. And there's also some unavoidable level of foreclosure because a lot of that is associated with death, disability, illness, divorce, and other things that happen that involve things that policy interventions are not going to really address. But I think what people are really trying to get at is the avoidable foreclosures those cases where maybe there's an opportunity to work out a deal and keep someone in a house because we know that uh, that for many people staying in the house is an important objective and to try to uh, make that easier to do. So what are the impediments to a lender and a borrower kind of working things out for themselves? Because we need to remember foreclosure is a costly process. The estimates suggest that uh, something like 30 to 60 percent of a loan of a mortgage is eaten up in the foreclosure process, although about half of that involves missed interest payments and other things that happen before the foreclosure process, and that's not what we're talking about. That's going to happen just because people are in some difficulty. So the other half, let's call it 20, 25 percent of the loan uh, value, just for the sake of argument, involves the legal costs of going through the process, preparing the house for sale, what have you. That's a lot of money, 25 percent of the mortgage value. Why can't people cut deals to avoid that cost and keep someone in the house? And there are a few impediments that exist to that occurring. The first is that the very process of securitization that Zanny pointed out can make the bargaining process more complicated because that mortgage is now sliced and diced in lots of different ways and it's not always clear with whom the borrower should be dealing. The mortgage service companies have uh, recently received some clarification that they are able to reach deals without triggering uh, tax problems for themselves because they weren't allowed to be an active manager of the portfolio. But there still is at least a little bit of ambiguity about the company that's sort of serving as the conduit for uh, the money that goes from the borrower out to all the people who now own the mortgage. The second problem, which I think is a bigger one, I actually think the securitization problem has been uh, mostly, if not entirely, addressed. The second problem, which is a much bigger one, is that something like 30 to 40 percent of subprime and alt-A loans, the ones that seem like they're the most risky at this point, have a second lien on them. That is, there's uh, a primary loan and then there's an additional loan uh, that has uh, a lower level of prioritization. And basically, at this point, those second liens are worth zero in current dollars, but think of it as basically a call option. Those, the people who hold those second liens have some, uh, some possible upside that maybe the house price somehow will recover and their second mortgage will become valuable again. And they can't lose any more money than zero. They're not going to pay money to the borrower. So right now it's worth basically zero in 
sort of a current value, but there's some possible upside in the future. When a loan is renegotiated, you generally, it varies by state, but you generally have to get the agreement of that second lien holder. And what's in it for them to give up that possible upside in the future? So they basically have a holdup on the whole renegotiation process that can be a very significant problem. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. All right, so what is being proposed to change to sort of put something new on the table to make that negotiation work better for both the borrower and the lender and try to reduce the number of avoidable foreclosures. There are two things that are being put on the table, uh, a carrot and a stick, and just to mix it up, I'll start with the stick. The stick is to change the way that the bankruptcy system works, which currently under Chapter 13 of the bankruptcy rules does not allow primary mortgage, mortgages on primary residences to be adjusted as part of a bankruptcy proceeding. So if you go into bankruptcy and your house is, uh, has negative value or is underwater, you can't get any relief from that as part of the bankruptcy proceedings, unlike all other kinds of your debts. So credit card debt, uh, even debt on a vacation home or whatever, you can get that adjusted, but not on the primary residence. There, is, there are proposals to say that judges should be allowed to adjust the mortgage in bankruptcy proceedings, just like they're allowed to adjust other kinds of debt. What that would do is it would create an incentive for the lenders to say, I don't want, if the judge is going to knock down the mortgage anyway, I might as well reach a deal with the borrower rather than have a judge do it and may that therefore encourage more renegotiations. The opposition to that change is that you're basically changing the nature of a contract that was formed uh, with one expectation about bankruptcy proceedings and the risk that uh, it may raise interest rates on future credit market transactions if the lenders think that this will uh, A, pose additional risk, and B, opens up a, a, a Pandora's box of other possible changes to the underlying contracts. That's the stick. The carrot, which is more in play because people don't like sticks apparently, is uh, to add additional access to a government insurance program that insures government loans. The Federal Housing Administration issues insurance on loans and mortgages of up to $730,000 in some areas, issued by approved private lenders. And the benefit here is really that if you renegotiate a loan and the borrower is now still in the house, there's still some risk to you that the borrower might default anyway. The government will step in and insure that loan so you no longer have that risk. And as a lender, that, that may make it more attractive to renegotiate. But the problem is, or not the problem, that insurance is not provided for free. And I think there's been a lot of discussion about how beneficial uh, the proposals to expand access to the Federal Housing Administration, uh, for example, embodied both in legislation that Representative Frank and Senator Dodd have been proposing. And in thinking about how much this will change the dynamics of that negotiation between the lenders and the borrowers for these problematic loans, the question is how much additional resources is the federal government putting on the table? What it's putting on the table is that insurance, but you're paying for that. And under the Frank proposal, for example, you pay a 3% upfront up fee, you pay 1.5% of the loan each year, and you also have to uh, hand over part of any appreciation that occurs if the house is subsequently sold at a higher price. When you do the calculation of uh, the value of the insurance versus how much you pay for it, the subsidy rates are very small, something like maybe 1, 2, or 3 percent, no more than 3 percent, say, of the value of the loan. So the federal government's stepping forward with something that's only a small share of the value that's sort of being discussed or under negotiation. And as a result of that, and also because many of the foreclosures are simply unavoidable, as I already mentioned, because of death and disability and what have you, we do not think that you're going to come anywhere close to the numbers of people or numbers of mortgages that are being discussed. Uh, there are assertions that these sorts of programs will affect millions of mortgages. I think it's much more likely that you'll wind up with perhaps several hundred thousand mortgages affected or being attracted by that subsidy net of the premiums that you pay. Another way of putting it is the total value that the federal government is going to be putting on the table, according to our preliminary analysis, is maybe a couple billion dollars a year at most. And so I would just put forward that while this perhaps may help, it's being in some quarters held up as a panacea. And given the scale of the problems that 
Zanny has already delineated, it seems unlikely to me that a, a billion or two or three billion dollars a year is going to be the cure-all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zanny. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I was supposed to be the cleanup man here and look uh, longer term. That is, imagining that we somehow, uh, via the FHA, the Federal Reserve, and whoever else, get out of this, get out of the worst of this mess. What should we be uh, thinking about doing so that, um, in terms of uh, broader, longer-term fix-ups? That is, what have we learned here, and what what changes should we make? Now, um, the manual says in a venue like this, unlike in a classroom, you're always supposed to start with a joke. Uh, unfortunately, this is not a very funny subject uh, that, we're, uh, uh, that we're dealing with. Um, uh, I'm reminded of the uh, saying that, uh, that can be adapted to many contexts, that there are actually three secrets to fixing the financial system. The only trouble is nobody knows what they are. Uh, I'm going to give you more than three, actually. Uh, but I want to say two things uh, uh, of a prefatory uh, nature. Uh, first of all, this is the agenda for later. If you're a member, I guess nobody here is, but if one was a member of Congress now, the focus needs to be on these FHA proposals, bankruptcy proposals, um, other things, uh, uh, on the liquidity provision by the Fed and so on things that have much more immediate uh, need. This is the agenda for, for the next president, uh, so to speak, what I'm about to uh, uh, speak of, whoever he or she is. Uh, secondly, this is not an agenda designed to prevent bubbles in the future. Uh, Zanny mentioned the South Sea bubble. Um, the South Sea company was the first joint stock company so the first issued stock led to the first stock bubble. So, so bubbles have been around as long as markets. I was at the IMF yesterday, and somebody there told me a story, which I haven't had time to check, uh, so that's the footnote, that there was a big land bubble. Now, housing bubbles are land bubbles, by the way. It's not bubbles over the bricks and timber. There, there was a big land bubble in Rome under Tiberius, in the year 33 AD, which ended badly. Uh, so uh, these things have been going on as long as there have been markets, and they will go on as long as there are markets. Our concern should be that we devise institutions that minimize rather than maximize the incidence and severity of bubbles, in full knowledge that there will be bubbles, and, and there always have been. So, so in that spirit, what I want to talk about is uh, ten things, and I'll be brief. Whenever you say a number like that, the audience sort of groans. Oh, we're going to be here all night. Uh, ten things, and I'll do it briefly, uh, that are of the nature of, uh, of the following nature. We just saw the tide go out. When the tide is in, you don't see the rocks. And that was the problem in the years 2004, 5, 6. When the tide goes out, you suddenly notice the sharp rocks. So the spirit of this is, given the sharp rocks we've now seen, what might we do? That doesn't mean there aren't other sharp rocks in there still covered by the tide, because the tide hasn't gone all the way out. We still have some water. That's the spirit of this list of ten. Six things I think we should do and can do. That doesn't mean we will do. Two things that have been suggested that I think we shouldn't do and then I'm adding at the end, very briefly, two pieces of wishful thinking. These are things we really should do, but I know we won't. <laughs> okay. So first of all, and this is, this is related to Zanny's list of uh, villains, it's become abundantly clear that we need in the United States a federal, and I underscore the word federal, regulator for all non-bank mortgage lending. Uh, bank mortgage lending is pretty well regulated. Footnote, I'll come back to the footnote in a second. Uh, Non-bank mortgage lending, which is where a great deal of this junk came uh, into being, uh, 
is not regulated at all by the federal government, and in some states it's really effectively not regulated uh, at all. The footnote is, again, a point Zanny made, the federal banking regulation, looking at the part of this problem that came out of the banks, the federal banking regulators, and there are four of them, didn't exactly cover themselves with glory in this episode, but they know that, and they're changing their ways. They just received a big kick in the teeth. They know that, and changes will be made, are already being made uh, in the federal banking regula uh, regulatory apparatus, but there is no federal mortgage banking regulatory apparatus to fix. We need one. As part of that, by the way, I believe it's crucial that we import an idea that is, has been, I don't know how old it is actually, it's been used for a long time in the investment community, which is a suitability standard. Stockbrokers can get into a lot of trouble by putting people into assets that they don't understand, that were not suitable given their economic means and knowledge. We need a suitability standard like that for mortgages, which would have prevented a lot of these simply nutty mortgage products that Zanny uh, talked about. So that's number one. Second, having to do with the securitization or what's typically called the originate to distribute model, uh, which we had, uh, which we've perfected in the United States. Uh, and which in many other countries doesn't exist, though it does exist in some, like, uh, like the UK. What we now realize is that this originate to distribute model creates some bad incentives. Uh, in particular, an incentive to pass the hot potato on and earn the fee, and then go like that. All right, that's it for me. I have nothing to do with that. So that happens at two levels. First, there's the originator, who may be a mortgage broker who has nothing to do with the bank, wanting to generate fee income for him or herself, and knowing that it's just going to get securitized and his or her company's not going to be owning this for more than a day and a half. Uh, second is the securitizers, who are also, or, or maybe I should say, may also be passing the entire thing on to Italian pension funds and Chinese banks and who knows who else that will wind up owning these things uh, after securitization. I'm talking about the mortgage-backed securities, the MBS and the CDOs and all that stuff. I think what we need to do here is not scrap the originate to distribute model. It has many, many virtues, including the, the liquidity that it provides and the lower mortgage rates that are uh, inherent in that greater liquidity. So we don't want to throw that baby out with the bathwater. But I think we could do a lot of good, again, not, not create perfection, but do a lot of good by requiring, so this is a regulatory step, that A, the originators, and B, the securitizers, securitizers excuse me, hold a piece of the mortgage pool. I'm not sure what that piece should be, 10% each maybe, something like that. So that would contract the securitization a little bit, but leave most of it intact and go a long way to uh, ameliorate, if not end, the game of hot potato. Because the game of hot potato is not so attractive if you're holding some of the hot stuff in your, uh, uh, in your hand. So that's the second thing. Third thing has to do with these uh, now notorious, they didn't used to be notorious, off-balance sheet entities. Well, actually they were. Starting in the Enron scandal, they became really notorious. But uh, the ones that are involved in this uh, set of uh, problems had not been previously thought of as notorious. So I'm talking about bank conduits, sieves, and things like that. Uh, this practice either has to end, which I think is probably not what we want to do, or be sharply curtailed. And what I mean by curtailment is one of two things bring the stuff onto a consolidated balance sheet. So stop the fiction that this is off somewhere in Never Never Land and has nothing to do with the main entity. The main entity is often a bank, but it might be a broker-dealer um, because it's an independent, freestanding um, uh, a company with its own balance sheet. It has nothing to do with the parent. Uh, what we... I, I, I was about to say what we learned. We didn't learn this. We knew this way before, is that it has a lot to do with the parent. And if there was hell to pay, the parent was going to pay some of the hell. So the, the other option, 
The other way to skin this cat is if you, if you don't literally bring it all back onto a consolidated balance sheet. By the way, I mean by that for purposes of regulatory capital. Um, to impose a capital charge for the liquidity and market risk that the parent is bearing, say the bank or the brokerage, because of the existence of the conduit whose assets it might have to take back or to whom it may have to make very large loans because the conduit doesn't have any cash. And both of those have happened in this uh, episode. Unfortunately, the regulatory regime that we took into the episode pretended that that could never happen and there shouldn't be any regulatory charges on the, uh, on the banks. Now, related to that, there are people, uh, I, I'm asked this a lot, and I hear this from a lot of people, uh, saying that we should end the mark-to-market system. And the argument for, uh, well, amended is really what I mean. Amended for cases in which there aren't really market prices. So what's happening now is their selling pressure has been created by the fact that some of these assets find no markets and therefore get marked down to incredibly low prices, imp in imposing very large book losses, many of which will probably be dissipated as the crisis lifts and we get some sane pricing in some of these markets. Um, the problem with this suggestion, the reason that I don't like, well, let, let me back up one step. It, there are legitimate problems that need some attention in how you apply mark-to-market accounting when markets stop functioning, okay? Functioning markets have small bid-ask spreads, so you know what the asset is worth. Non-functioning markets have gigantic bid-ask spreads. If the bid is 20 and the ask is 65, who knows what this thing is worth? And that's a big problem with mark-to-market uh, accounting. But having said that, I know a wrong answer, which is to put, put it in at face value. I'm pretty sure 100 is the wrong answer when the bid is 20 and the ask is 65. Uh, so this reminds me really of Churchill's characterization of democracy as the worst form of government until you start thinking about the alternatives. And that's what I think mark-to-market accounting is. It's the worst form of accounting until you start thinking about the alternatives. So that's one of those things that I think we don't want to do, even though it is uh, somewhat problematic right now. Um, next thing on my list, what we need to do is reduce uh, leverage. And I'm thinking especially about the broker-dealers who now have, for better or for worse, been brought under the Federal Reserve's lender of last resort safety net. One has had access to it in a literal sense, and lots are now borrowing from the Fed through, through the primary dealer. Uh, facility, which I think has now lent over $200 billion. I'm not sure if I'm... Is that right, Erica? I saw you walk in. Yeah, something over $200 billion. That's not chump change. Uh, if an institution, it used to be only banks, but now it's banks and brokerages, is going to have the protection of the Federal Reserve's lender of last resort authority in times of duress, then it must operate on a safer and sounder basis than previously when it didn't have that protection, much like banks do. And that means less leverage. Uh, as probably all of you know from reading the newspapers, Bear Stearns wound up with a 33 times leverage about. Banks usually operate more like 10 times leverage. So if these uh, companies, uh, the living ones, are going to be covered by the Federal Reserve's uh, uh, safety net, they need to operate with less leverage. That's going to be a big change for the industry. That's going to mean uh, a lower return on capital, not to put too fine a point on it. And uh, the industry is not going to like that at all because it really cares about its return on capital. Uh, but that's a corollary of the, uh, of the extension of the safety net. Now, uh, on this subject of lower leverage and closer supervision, uh, uh, I believe that we, and now I'm broadening this to the world, need uh, to much better cross-border financial supervision. Uh, frankly, that is largely hortatory language now. I exaggerate slightly. 
there is cooperation across uh, national borders, but it's nothing like what it should be and needs to be given the international scope of some of these uh, entities. So that applied to the, uh, to the big global banks, but now under this new doctrine, it also is going to apply to the big global brokerage uh, houses. Uh, somebody needs to be able to follow them as they move around the globe and know what's going on in country X, even though you're the supervisor of country Y. Uh, in principle, we do that now. We have to do it much, much, much better. Now, on this subject of supervising um, large multifunctional financial institutions, I have heard it also suggested that we made a mistake in 1999 when we abolished uh, Glass-Steagall and brought down the wall between uh, the investment banking brokerage industry and the banking industry. A wall, by the way, that was porous and crumbling. So, and To my mind, this was largely in large measure, recognizing de jure what had already happened de facto. In any case, I don't think this is a good idea um, for two reasons. First of all, the, this extension of the Federal Reserve safety net is now taking both of these pieces, both of these industries under the same uh, lender, of la lender of last resort umbrella, which suggests you want to treat them more the same uh, and not try to put this artificial wall in, uh, between them. The other thing I say to people that advocate this is to tell me what damaging practices, some of the things on Zanny's list, would have been avoided uh, if Glass-Steagall were still in effect. And I have a hard time coming up with any answers. I just don't see that that was really a contributory factor. The tremendous financial innovations, which I'm coming to now, were, but the Glass-Steagall I don't think was. Uh, finally, on my list of things to do, is we need to do something about the rating agencies, something Zanny also uh, made reference to. Uh, like the securitizers and the originator, they've had bad incentives uh, because they get paid by the issuers. Uh, this is a very tough problem. It's not obvious what you do about it. Some internal reforms of the way these rating agencies, these companies, they are for-profit companies after all, work are needed and they're underway. I mean, it's not like Moody's and Standard & Poor's don't understand that this is a problem. They do, and they're both looking to change their internal, uh, improve their internal controls, ombudsman, and a variety of other things, and all of that is to the good. Uh, but I, I'm not convinced uh, that that's enough. Uh, I, I've either thought of or heard of two ideas that I think are worth thinking about, and there may be an idea three or four that is better than either of these. Uh, so what I'm basically urging is we start thinking about this in a serious uh, way. One is to have the um, rating agencies hired and paid by, say, the SEC or some such public agency rather than by the issuer. They can't be hired by the buyers. That's the problem because information, once it's out, once it's rated, everybody else gets it for free. So the natural thing to an economist, okay, let's get it paid for by the other side of the market. You can't do that. Uh, so that's what leads me to think of maybe the government. So then in that case, there would be a levy to have access to the bond market. That levy would then go to pay the bills, but the hiring agent would not be the company that's coming up with the latest CDO cube, but would be the SEC that would instruct the rating agency to go in there and rate this for us. Second idea, which one of my colleagues at Princeton just came up with today over the lunch table, I thought it was a clever idea, is uh, what if instead the rating, instead of being paid with cash, the rating agencies were paid with a sliver of the bond issue that they just rated, adjusted for the default probability that they attached to it. So if they get it right, they're clean. If they get it wrong in, in the direction we're worried about, they could get it wrong in the other direction. We're not so worried about that. If they get it wrong in the direction we're worried about, they suffer in terms of their compensation. Uh, that would be, I think, a nice way to improve the incentives of the uh, rating agencies. Okay, very briefly, I said I, said I had two things in the wishful thinking bin, so I'm just going to mention them because these are not, these really should happen and will not happen. 
Okay, so the first has to do with the, the financial innovation that Zanny was uh, talking about. Um, it would be good, I believe, now this may be where the former bank regulator in me is showing through, um, if there were more, if there were fewer of these incredibly complicated over-the-counter derivatives and more plain vanilla derivatives that were traded on exchanges that we could watch, that we could understand, that we could have data on, and so on. That's the first thing that won't happen. Uh, and the second thing I think that would help is if we had more transparency in the currently non-transparent parts of the financial markets. So that goes to the hedge funds and, thing, and institutions like that much more than the banks. And that, too, will not happen. Thank you. So now I think uh, my understanding is the floor is open for questions, which you can address to uh, any of us that you uh, wish. There are a few folks right there with a microphone. So wait till you get a microphone before your question. And please identify yourself so we know whether you're from the IRS or not. Thank you. Uh, Robert Johnson from the United Nations. Uh, question mainly for you, uh, Professor Binder, as the theoretician uh, of the group. Um, the international institutions and the international economists have said for a number of years that the American fiscal and trade deficits were uh, unsustainable under this euphemism of global imbalances. Uh, I wonder if those elements are in the back of this room somewhere. Uh, and if uh, maybe what we have here is basically a case of uh, the United States living beyond its means in both its national and in international accounts. Well, at, at one level that's an easy question. The other level is a very hard question. Uh, the easy level is just to answer yes. We are living way beyond our means, and it's almost definitionally true when you're running trade deficits. This really doesn't have to do so much with the budget deficit, except to the extent that it's foreigners that finance it. Uh, uh, so when you're running a large trade deficit, as we are chronically, uh, you are consuming more than you're producing, basically. And that, to me, is the definition of living beyond uh, their means, uh, our means. Uh, uh, Solving that problem is probably in the wishful thinking uh, uh, category as long as the rest of the world is willing to lend us so much money on such reasonable terms. I mean, why should we Americans stop our profligate ways? So I don't think we will stop our profligate ways unless uh, the rest of the world starts charging us a lot more for lending money for, for us to borrow than they have uh, in the past. Now the hard question is, uh, uh, this may be me interpreting what you ask, is does that have anything to do with the stuff we've just been talking about, the housing bubble and uh, things like that? I, you know, I think a little bit, but not that much. The low interest rates, which is a gift from the rest of the world, uh, did have something to do with it, as, uh, um, as Annie said. It's also the case that if you're consuming like mad, you have to spend your money on something, and one thing you can spend it on is housing, but you could also spend it on lots of other things. So there was probably some contribution uh, through that. But I, I don't think the, uh, the federal budget deficit or the, or the imbalance in our foreign trade were major factors in the, the, the housing mess uh, and therefore it is not necessary to address those problems in order to get out of the housing mess. There's if I, if I can just add one thing, Please. one of the things that uh, has actually gone better than possibly uh, some people expected has to do with the fact that one of the implications of our large external imbalance is that the dollar was going to de depreciate and there was some risk that it would occur in a very disorderly and sort of traumatic way, uh, a hard landing. Uh, 
So far, that has not happened. So the dollar has been depreciating, but it's not been at, a, at such a pace that has caused the kind of turmoil that some feared. And partially as a result of that and partially as a result of other things, the external account ha has actually stabilized and, it, and by some measures, depending on what you do with, the, with oil, has actually narrowed slightly, which is not to say that we're yet on a sustainable path, but it is to say that that adjustment process has gone better than some feared. Sure. I, I would just say two things. Um, firstly, to echo Peter's point, I think that for many people, the worry about the external imbalances was that there would be um, – that the, 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 the causality would go – foreigners would suddenly take fright. They would suddenly realize that they were funding massive profligacy in the U.S. They would suddenly take fright. The dollar would crash, and we'd have an unholy mess. In fact, the causality has gone exactly the other way. The U.S. Um, disabers, the, the profligate – American spenders have seen their assets or are seeing their assets, particularly their housing price assets, plunge in value. They're therefore unable. They're feeling poorer. They're spending less. U.S. domestic spending has slowed dramatically. They're under all kinds of pressure for, from, from many areas. Because their spending has slowed dramatically, U.S. domestic demand has slowed. The dollar has fallen. U.S. net exports have risen. And so this external imbalance is, as Peter said, shrinking and I think is going to continue to shrink. So I think one in, in my view, one positive corollary of this whole mess is actually going to be that the external imbalances of the U.S. are unwound. But they're not unwound because foreigners become less keen on lending to the U.S. More they become, they become unwound because the actual U.S. domestic spending slows. And the risk of that is obviously that if you have the U.S. domestic demand slowing too much, then you have this unwinding coming at the price of much slower global growth. Uh, I would like to ask each of the three of you to look ahead. Is the worst of the credit crisis over, or are there other shoes left to drop? And if so, what are they? That sounds like something Alan should answer first. <laughs> oh, yeah? All right. Well, I wish I knew the answer to that question, Lynn. Um, I, th I think the worst is over, but I say that with some trepidation, because there are, the are other shoes uh, left to fall. Uh, I mean, we have seen this credit crisis crop up in very surprising places, such as, for example, those auction rate securities in the mun in, uh, municipals. The Port Authority of New York paid 20 percent tax-free interest rate for, what, one week or so? I'm not sure for how long. It didn't last that long, but that's a little wacky. That's more than a little um, wacky. Uh, I. In my morbid moments, uh, I fear two things, but there are probably seven things I haven't thought about. I'm not even smart enough to fear. One is that the contagion in asset-backed securities, and there was a lot of contagion. You know, it started with securities owned, backed by subprime mortgages, which is where the problem was, and then it started spreading to others, uh, could spread to things like credit card receivables. And just imagine the impact on the American consumer if the credit card receivable market, I don't want to say stops functioning, but starts malfunctioning in a way that, uh, that leads to notices that your credit card line got shrunk or something like that. I mean, that's a real way to sow panic uh, um, in the land. The other thing that really hasn't happened yet to any but a very trivial degree is money market mutual funds breaking the buck. That would be another confidence uh, shatterer. So, you know, the game is we're, we're gradually, I think, rebuilding the shattered confidence. It's still at a very low level and very fragile. So if some, and as I said, there are probably other shoes I'm not thinking about. If one of these other shoes uh, drops, th the little confidence that we've rebuilt can come undone very quickly and in very nasty ways. I, uh, I think I would agree with that. I think probably um, the worst of the financial crisis is over. And I think that, that March 17th, 18th or whatever it was, when the, 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 the week at the Bear Stearns weekend was a real turning point. And it was a turning point not just because of the Fed's involvement in the Bear Stearns rescue and not just because of the extension of the Fed's safety net to investment banks, as Alan pointed out, but because there was then, I think, a sense that people realized the central bank would go to the edge and over the edge 
to stop financial Armageddon. I mean, that, that was really, that, that, that tail risk, if you, might, if you put, want to put it that way, was really reduced. And secondly, I think that came along with a perception that Congress, um, and having listened to Peter, maybe uh, it seems to me that this perception is misguided, but that Congress would also pull out all stops to prevent a really nasty spiraling in foreclosures. And that there was a sense that not only was the, the broad fiscal stimulus package passed very quickly, that there's a, there's a kind of sense of urgency in Washington, and that if necessary, public money would be thrown at this problem. And I think there's, a, there's been a sort of... And, and if you couple that with a third factor, which is that markets were already pricing in extraordinarily high defaults in the, in the residential mortgage market, that those three together have sort of taken the worst of the financial panic off. I mean, yeah, I, I think... Uh, we, we have sort of modeled what happens to the U.S. economy if the rest of the world grows at four or five, let's say five percent, or if it grows at three percent or two percent. And the answer is it doesn't have uh, as big an effect on the U.S. economy as you might imagine. And that's partly because the export share, share of output is not, I mean, it's something like, you know, 20, it's, let's say a fifth. So the effect of having five percent rather than three percent externally has to be divided by five to get uh, an effect on the U.S. and you get something like, you know, maybe a, something like a half a percent of GDP growth maximum. And that's, by the way, that's a huge change in the global growth rate if you're talking about two percentage points per year. And whether a half a percent difference on the U.S. economy makes the difference between, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that's going to be the key dynamic. Obviously, it will matter a lot for the rest of the world whether they grow at 5% or 3%, but the effect on the U.S. economy is uh, significantly mitigated. Let me, let me just add something slightly disagreeing with that. Um, I mean, not in a fundamental way disagreeing with it, but um, over the last seven quarters or so, housing has dragged the GDP down by about 1%. That is, you can compute the growth rate of what I call the 96%, 4% of the economy is housing about, and compare that to the growth rate of the GDP. And I've done that. And if you make that comparison, it's been remarkably constant at about a one-point difference. In several of the recent quarters, net exports turning more favorable have added one percentage mm -hmm. point. So that's a complete offset, uh, not for all seven of those quarters but for several of those, and it looks that way going forward. Now, we can't be sure. And the reason that we get more than from the differential growth rate that Peter said is the exchange rate that you mentioned. We're looking at a cheaper dollar, and we're gaining some uh, net exports from that. So I think uh, rising net exports is indeed part of the macroeconomic solution. The other respect in which I, uh, I think you raise a good question is alleviating the financial stress. Um, we need in the United States uh, several things, of which I'll mention two, that can come from, for example, from sovereign wealth funds and are starting to come from sovereign wealth funds. First of all, our financial institutions need to be recapitalized. So we know how we did it. They did it in Japan. It was massive infusions of public money. Um, it's better if you can do it with uh, out massive infusions of taxpayer money. And um, so to the extent we can get this from sovereign wealth funds, uh, that's good for us. We should uh, welcome that. And some of it's happening, and there may be a lot more. Because after all, I think there are potential bargains to be uh, had. These stocks have been beaten down like mad. Um, the other respect, uh, which I think is probably more important quantitatively, or could be anyway, is that in a situation that we're now in with these frozen and semi-frozen credit markets all over the place, it's not just mortgages, but it's especially uh, mortgages, the need that our financial markets have is for patient capital that is not concerned with short-term liquidity and is not particularly concerned with short-term mark-to-market. Okay? So this is the opposite of a Wall Street firm. Okay? If you say a Wall Street firm cares about its marking to market every day, uh, is completely obsessed with liquidity, probably for good reasons, um, and is certainly not known for patient capital. But compare that to the Princeton, Harvard, and Yale endowments, 
uh, who don't really worry about day-to-day mark-to-market. Who cares? Uh, who certainly don't worry about liquidity because the tiniest little fraction of the asset base gets sold off in one little year. In fact, much less than the earnings. Uh, so the last thing they worry about is liquidity and has very patient, is very patient capital. Well, sovereign wealth funds are like that in large measures. And believe it or not, they have more money than Harvard. Uh, <laughs> I, would ju- I would, I think... If I detect this subtle disagreement between the two of you, I suspect I'm, I'm slightly more uh, uh, in Alan's camp than Peter's. I think that the, the, the global economy is cushioning the U.S. and has cushioned the U.S. and will continue to cushion the U.S. Um, I think it is, you know, we've, we've had uh, in many newspapers, and including my own, long debates about decoupling. Is the rest of the world economy decoupled from the U.S.? And the, the actual word decoupling has always struck me as being a bit ridiculous, because either a train is decoupled or it's not. It's a totally binary issue. Um, in the reality, the, 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 the rest of the world is never totally decoupled from the U.S., but the links, I think, or the reliance um, on the U.S. is much less. And certainly there is has been... Um, fast demand growth in the rest of the world, and that's extremely important for the U.S. now. But there's, there's one twist to this tale that I think is, is increasingly obvious to all of us, and that's that um, demand growth in the rest of the world is one of many factors that is pushing up commodity prices. And traditionally, when you had slowdown in the U.S., you also had commodity prices fall. The oil price would traditionally fall something like 20% when the U.S. went into recession. The fact that it does not, and it's hit, what, $119 a barrel, maybe $120. I've been on the train for the past two hours. It's probably gone up again. Um, means that for the U.S. consumer, who is at the epicenter of this downturn, you have an extra hit. Um, and you have higher gasoline prices. You have higher food prices. You have a real income shock to a consumer who has already been battered by lower house prices and so forth. So I think that while broadly um, it's, it's a great for the U.S. economy that the rest of the world is, is doing as well as it is. There are shifts in relative prices that are, rel- that are hurting U.S. consumers in a way that they would not have been hurt in previous recessions. And maybe I could just uh, – I don't actually think there's very much disagreement because uh, it's clear that net exports have been providing a cushion to the U.S. economy. The question is how much does a plausible variation in the rest of the world's growth rate mm-hmm. feedback on the U.S. economy – Net exports will still be a cushion if the rest of the world is growing 4% instead of 5%. We have one up front here. Thank you. Javid Khan. I'm still trying to grapple the scope and the scale of the whole mortgage mess. Uh, I read um, an article last year that the total residential stock of the U.S. is $20 trillion in value. Before Housing the, stock, yeah. $20 trillion before it started declining. And so far, the decline has brought down to $18 trillion. So one question is how far it will go to 15 or $10 trillion before we will say a reasonable value of this residential stock has been reached. Second, so far the financial institutions have written off through public disclosures almost $200 billion from the third quarter of last year till now. UBS, Citibank, Merrill Lynch, etc., major institutions. So if $200 billion is the write-off so far in the beginning or the middle or the end of this crisis, then what is the remaining amount, if any of you have any idea, <laughs> whether it represents 10% of the total or 20 or whatever, and the Third related question is, no one has mentioned the size and scope or uh, commercial real estate stock in the United States. Is that subject or susceptible to this crisis or not? And if not, why not? How about if I answer the first question and then we can... uh, Go ahead. ahead. Answer as many as you can. Um, (laughs) I won't do that. I'll answer as many as I think would be a good idea. Um, On the first question, there's a significant divergence in uh, analyses of additional price declines and therefore feeding through to the value of uh, the housing stock from what we're getting from financial markets and what some simple metrics might suggest. So let me start with the simple metrics because they're scarier. If you look back at, for example, the price to rental ratio, which is one way of measuring uh, how far out of whack things got 
the, the, the price of a house versus how much you can rent it for or how much you'd have to pay to rent housing uh, with some uh, thought that over long periods of time there should be some relationship between those two. Uh, you could get, and Bob Schiller at Yale gets, uh, you know, total price declines that are very substantial, often 40 or 50 percent, and you know, only something like 10 or 15 of that has occurred. If you, however, look at uh, financial markets, so uh, the admittedly somewhat thin markets on uh, the forward and futures contracts on the Case-Shiller uh, indexes that Zanny mentioned and other related uh, approaches to trying to gauge how much financial markets are betting, you get something more in the in the range of 10 to 15 percent additional price declines. So for whatever that's worth, those are the the two metrics that one could look at. Should I uh, shall I try the second one? Yeah. Um, uh, the honest answer is that nobody had, nobody has any idea what the final losses will be. Um, it depends importantly on the answer to the question that Peter was looking at. You know, how much will house prices decline? Um, there have, however, been um, several separate estimates recently which have all seemed to converge around the trillion dollar mark um, for total losses. There was one prepared by a group of Wall Street economists for the Monetary Policy Conference, um, Jan Hatzius of Goldman Sachs and, and several colleagues, um, which looked at several different methods and came up with an overall loss of about a trillion dollars. The IMF in its... Um, last financial stability report also had a um, similar estimate. That is split. Um, th the question then is, how, where is that split? Who's holding that? And the, and I may have these numbers slightly wrong, but my, my memory is that around half is expected to be held by leveraged US financial institutions. Um, and then beyond that, how much has to be, how much is real losses once you can take back tax benefits from writing down losses and so forth is, is somewhat lower. It, it's, I think the end result is that we haven't seen enough write-downs, um, but we are getting there in terms of the U.S. If that breakdown, if that aggregate magnitude is about right and the breakdown between U.S. financial institutions and non-U.S. financial institutions, we're, we're, we're not fully there yet, but we're getting there. I just, I just want to add that, that if, you, if you think of that as the Wall Street whisper number, a trillion now, two months ago that was $600 billion. Six months ago, it was 200 billion. It's a little scary to me, but a, a trillion is now the uh, trillion here, trillion the, there. A whisper, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you don't even need the here and there. You're talking real money at the first trillion. Uh, and to your last question, the answer is commercial real estate is susceptible. It is on the list of things that haven't uh, uh, collapsed yet, and we hope won't collapse. So there was a gentleman over here at this table, right there. Then we'll come over here. Thank you. Paul Brodsky. And uh, my, my question um, probably goes to Zanny's litany of bad behavior, and uh, maybe uh, Professor Blinder can, can help me out with this uh, within your wishful thinking category. Uh, my question is uh, if, the f if the final credit decisions are being made by disparate institutional investors out there, many of whom have these fiduciary responsibilities. They're buying mortgage-backed securities and asset-backed securities and CDOs and the whole litany of stuff. And their performance metrics are based on relative, relative returns. Then is anyone really, does anyone really care whether or not they make a bad credit decision if at the end of the day, uh, if there's a trillion dollars in bad debt made and a trillion dollars in bad credit issued, uh, it's okay for them as long as all their peers have done the same thing. So it goes to, would a way to look at, in the wishful thinking category, should we somehow alter the investment objectives of fiduciary investors, institutional fiduciary investors out there, so that what they should be concerned mostly with is whether or not uh, they are making investment decisions based on maintaining their constituents' purchasing power above all else and forgetting about relative returns. Go ahead. Oh, you this wanted me to take that. <laughs> 
I'm not quite sure I understand. I mean, there are many different kinds of, are, are you speaking about fiduciaries who are running pension funds and other things like that where the safety is more of a concern than the return? Is that I didn't, because I mean, there were so many people running money in so many different ways for so many different constituents. I, I'm not quite sure which ones you're thinking about, except, and, but I, so, so answer the question for me. But the one thing I did want to say is where I think you're leading with the question is something I've always thought is correct that we compensate traders, and when I say we, the industry, compensates traders in ways that can only be called strange and wondrous uh, and uh, don't seem to make sense to me. So I think you were leading somewhere that way with the question. Well, with the exception of, of uh, college, college endowments, which I, I do agree, uh, take the long view, um, and really care about uh, um, satisfying their constituents' uh, future purchasing power. I'm speaking about pension funds and uh, mutual funds and institutional investors that are judged each year relative to their peers or relative to indexes, underlying indexes, whether or not the stock market is up or the bond market is down. It doesn't matter as long as they're within a bell curve of their, of their, mm -hmm. of their peer group. Okay. And so if everyone is making bad decisions to buy bad debt right. um, in the uh, originate and distribute model, mm -hmm. then there's really no check on that, yeah. regardless of how much oversight you have at the, uh, of, at the governmental level, is there? Right. Okay. I guess as between the two, I think I understand the question better now. As between the two stylized options, which is you're compensated only based on your relative performance compared to an index or something like that, or you're just compensated on the return, positive or negative. I'm pretty sure I prefer the former. I mean, what we saw in the tech bubble, in the stock market bubble in, uh, uh, that burst in 2000 is people getting fantastic compensation because the S&P index was going up and they're riding up, or the NASDAQ was going up, and they were riding up with it and not, not, doing any, not adding any value. Uh, at all, so I th I think if if I have to choose between those two forms, uh, I guess I pick the relative one. Anybody else? Yeah. But of course, uh, it's not I, my choice. To, I guess to, I would to, also, and this gets back a bit to what your your first point that you made about the curious compensation structure on the for traders. It seems to me that um, you you are um, addressing the incentives for the end investor and therefore where the end investor has an incentive to really carefully monitor the quality of this stuff. Um, it seems to me that there's a huge issue about compensation and incentives by issuers and by investment banks in particular, um, where you do seem to you know, be paid enormously in good times and have very little <coughs> downside. Um, and that, that if we're thinking about where there are skewed incentives, that's an area where I would focus first. I think you would get quite a lot of bang for your buck in rethinking compensation there more, more easily um, and, and certainly more quickly than the more fundamental things that you're talking about on the investor side. Okay, this will be the last question. My name is Basil Whiting. Uh, I do a lot of work in community development, and uh, it's clear that uh, hindsight is always uh, 20 20. About three years ago, I was spending a lot of time in Cleveland, and it was also very clear at that time that something very, very wrong was going uh, on in the subprime lending market in neighborhoods. I guess my question is, was it someone's job? Was it a statesman, a woman, a business of finance, or academia, or government's job to sound the alarm here, to scream in the night about this developing crisis? Uh, or was someone doing that and no one was listening? Uh, how do we have someone overseeing this? Is it the regulatory process that you think should be expanded that would do that? Uh, but it would seem to me that some of the leading statesmen and women of seniority in, the, in these uh, affected sectors would have been in a position to scream at some forum and cause some attention to be gathered to this long ago. 
Well, there, there was one person who, uh, Ned Gramlich, who has unfortunately passed away, who was sounding the alarm but uh, may not have had a, a loud enough megaphone to affect the course of policy. But he was very clearly raising concerns um, several years ago and raising questions about why the, why the most complicated uh, mortgage products were being sold to the least sophisticated borrowers. I had, um, I was in Cleveland about, uh, I guess in about November last year, and I went to Maple Heights, a um, suburb of Cleveland, old suburb, and the mayor of Maple Heights was a very astute man. Who, Maple Heights has been decimated by foreclosures. One in ten properties is under foreclosure. You really see the kind of collateral damage on this old-time suburb, which was already in quite a lot of trouble, but the, the city government has had to lay off 30% of its staff, amenities are being closed. It's, it's very clear that this is a kind of a suburb that is slowly dying. And he, he said, he said I, I, I find it hard to understand why nobody in Washington was sounding the alarm. It was so obvious to me that something was amiss when I saw house prices in my suburb rising at double-digit rates when we were losing population and unemployment was rising. It just didn't make sense. And it was so kind of manifestly clear there. Um, I think, as, as Peter mentioned, Ned Gramley was raising the alarm. Uh, I suspect that um, this wouldn't have been radically changed, even if that had, the alarm had been sounded louder. But I think that this is one area where one um, can fault former Chairman Greenspan for not, not only not sounding the alarm, if anything, cheerleading. Um, and I think that there was a manifest lack of focus uh, at the Federal Reserve um, for some understandable reasons that a lot of this stuff happened outside of their regulatory ambit. But nonetheless, um, had there been um, some uh, tough words, some words of caution from someone like that, I suspect it wouldn't have radically changed the course of history, but it might at the margin have made a difference. Yeah, I, I don't need to repeat what you've uh, just heard. I agree with all that. With, with, the, with the one nuance, I think, uh, had the regulators uh, cracked down on ninja loans and liar loans and things like that, as they should have, given the fact that most of the worst stuff happened at the end, which is, by the way, always the case in bubbles. The craziest things happen in the closing months. Um, this situation could have been very substantially ameliorated, very substantially. It doesn't have to do with setting interest rates. It had to do with regulatory policy. That's just a slight nuance of difference yeah, yeah. to Zanny.